Hey, it's Rifty again. For this portion of the notes, I kind of recruited my son <clears throat> to help me out with an example. So I'm going to let him sit here and talk to you for just one second, and then I'll be right back. Hi, and I know this is... Ah! Oh, I know. That was the purpose. Thanks for your help. High five. All right, see you later. Oh, yeah, I'm out of here. Okay, so there's a reason why I did that. Why? Um, is because I wanted to show you um, a homeostatic mechanism. Basically, when my son was sitting here just chilling in the chair, doing nothing, he's at a very calm, stable working environment. But what I did is I tricked him into sitting into the chair and start talking to you, and I walked up and I provided a stimulus, which was me yelling or scaring him. And if you notice, you could see his response or his reaction to an external stimuli, which causes a change in homeostasis in his body. So what you need to understand is, in order, in order to understand any type of homeostatic regulation or feedback system, you need to know there are main components, whether you're trying to eliminate the stimulus or promote the stimulus. So the main components of any homeostatic regulation or feedback system are going to be receptors. There's going to be some kind of monitor or collector of the stimuli that then transfers the message or the change in the homeo change in homeostasis to the control center. The control center is going to be essentially your brain and your spinal cord or central nervous system, which receives the information from the receptor and actually makes some kind of decision on how to respond to that change in the internal or external environment. For example, um, these things can be conscious or subconscious decisions. Like you can actually physically choose to remove yourself from the heat outside. That is a conscious decision. But a subconscious decision made by your body in response to a receptor is your brain sending a signal to your sweat glands starts telling them to sweat. Um, the third main component of any feedback or regulatory system or homeostatic regulation system is going to be the effector. This is the organ or structure or part of your body that actually takes the orders from your brain and exhibits some kind of response. So when I sat my poor son here and scared him, um, you will notice that there could be several things going on that can be the receptor and the effector. But what you, the biggest things I need you to understand is the fact that a receptor is always going to be a body part. There's always going to be some kind of structure, gland, something along the lines in your body that receives or detects the stimulus. It is then going to send that signal that it has obtained a change in the environment to the control center. The control center in almost every single situation in your body or the human body is going to be the brain and the spinal cord. So it receives the information from the body and makes some kind of decision on how to respond to it. The control center then sends the signal out of the brain slash spinal cord to the effector. The effector is also always going to be some kind of structure, part, tissue, gland, I don't care what you say, but it's always a something in the body that exhibits a response. Okay. So those were the three main components, and there's more specific details within each, within each one. So one of the big types of feedback systems or feedback loops or homeostatic regulation systems is going to be what's called a negative feedback system. These are, occur most frequently in the body and most of the time are occurring at the subconscious level, meaning you have no idea your body's reacting to the stimulus. But here's how it works. Keep in mind that a stimulus is some kind of change internal or external that causes the body to deviate from its normal homeostasis or normal situation. In the example that we did with my son at the very, very beginning of this video, I sat him here, he's sitting there, and I just screamed, yelled, and scared him. The scream or the yell was the stimulus that caused his body to deviate from homeostasis or its normal situation. What you will notice is that stimulus sends a signal to his control center. The control center, being his brain, sends a signal back out to the body, which that signal that it sends out back out to the body, it's sending it to the effector to exhibit a response. The response is what your body does to get rid of, at least in a negative feedback system, to get rid of that stimulus. So when I scared him in that negative feedback loop, 
The stimulus was my yell. The receptor of that stimulus would be his ears. The ears send a signal to the control center, which is his brain. His brain says, that was a loud, extremely loud noise. It sends a signal back out to multiple places. You only have to really understand one, but that brain or control center sends a, control center sends a signal out of, the out of the brain to the body, specifically in this one, the example would be his muscles, causing his muscles to tense up and flinch away from the stimulus. So the body had a response, the muscles exhibited a response, which was the flinching or turning away from the stimulus. And by getting away from the loud noise, it causes the body to return to homeostasis. A negative feedback, its main goal is to eliminate or decrease the stimulus that has occurred. In fancy terms, you're making the deviation is made smaller. The deviation away from homeostasis is decreased. The best example that most kids use throughout this entire thing is going to be adjustments made to temperature. So you're outside, it's 101 degrees, the humidity level is at like 80%, and so that makes the heat index like 115, but you have to be outside. So you're sitting outside, what happens is there's temperature um, receptors in your skin, that they're called thermoreceptors, that detect an increase in temperature. There's also thermoreceptors inside your body that regulate the temperature inside your body. Both of those two pick up the stimulus, noticing that, hey, our body temperature is increasing. That stimulus is picked up by the receptors and they send a signal to the brain. The brain decides what to do. The brain is the control center and it says, well, it's hot, let's sweat. So it sends a signal out of the control center to the effectors. In this situation, the effectors are going to be sweat glands. Telling the sweat glands to produce or secrete sweat, actually in this particular example, be excrete sweat, and the excretion of the sweat is the response causing your body temperature to return to a normal situation. Um, other examples could be your blood pressure rising. You want to bring that back down to a normal situation. Um, yeah. um, a big example that we use, at least in biomedical science, is going to be <clears throat> your body's response to increased blood sugar levels because the inability to regulate blood sugar usually results in diabetes. But, um, so your stimulus is you're sitting around, you're eating this great big old cheeseburger, mm, yum, 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 you eat it up, you get a rising blood glucose level. That rising blood glucose level is the stimulus. That stimulus is detected by high blood glucose level insulin secreting cells in your pancreas. So the pancreas would be, I guess you could say, um, the receptor of the stimuli. It then sends a signal to itself or to the brain, and then the brain sends a signal back that says, hey, we need to secrete some insulin so that we can take up all this extra glucose in the body and cause it to be stored in cells. So insulin is secreted out of the pancreas. That insulin goes to the body cells, telling them to take up more glucose, which then causes the body to return to normal homeostatic blood glucose levels. So in this situation, the stimulus is going to be the rise in blood glucose levels. The receptor is going to be the pancreas. In this particular example, um, the control center is still going to be the brain. And then the effector is going to be your body cells. And the response is the absorption of glucose from the bloodstream to decrease blood glucose levels. Positive feedback systems occur uh, less frequently within the body. But their main purpose here is there's a variation in homeostasis and we actually want to increase the strength of that variation so that we can then promote and increase the actual um, response. <clears throat> so again, stimulation comes in, picked up by a receptor, the receptor sends a signal to the control center, the control center decides what to do. In this particular example, the control center says, hey, whatever's going on here, this is good for us, let's increase that. So then it sends a signal back out to specific structures in the body, which are the effectors, and the effectors promote a response that actually increases that stimulus. The biggest example is, for most people, is going to be labor and delivery, but also a fever to kill a foreign body. Most of the time when humans have a fever, we actually attempt to 
decrease that fever because rises in body temperature can cause uh, living tissue to die. But fevers actually have a positive mechanism to them. When you increase the temperature in the body, it makes it hard for foreign pathogens to survive. So it's a response. So you have a foreign pathogen, your body's um, receptors say, hey, these bacteria are supposed to be here, sends a signal to the brain, brain says, hey, let's run a fever, so we can up the temperature. So the temperature of your body increases, the effect is your body, or the response is your body increases in temperature, and what it's trying to do is actually get rid of the bacteria. If it doesn't work, the body's temperature continually increases until um, the appropriate response is reached. <clears throat> um, one of the most common though is in fact labor and delivery. So as you know, babies come out head first. Well, when contractions start to occur, the baby's head pushes against the cervix. Well, nerve, nerves in the cervix actually send a signal to the brain. That brain then says, oh man, baby's got to get out, baby's got to get out. So what it does is it causes, tells the brain, tells the pituitary gland to secrete more oxytocin. Oxytocin is carried to the bloodstream to the uterus. Well, more oxytocin increases or stimulates the uterine, uterus to contract, which then pushes the fetus again on the cervix. Well, when it pushes there, the cervix receives that signal again, and the whole process does a loop, and it continually increases in strength over and over and over and over and over again until contractions result in a time frame which they are really, really close together, like two to five minutes. Then mom starts pushing, and then baby leaves, and then we result to a negative feedback system trying to eliminate those. So in this particular example, we continually want the uterus to contract and contract and contract so we can get baby out. Then once it's out, it reverts to a negative feedback system to eliminate those uterine contractions so it no longer is trying to push baby out. Another really common positive, uh, positive feedback system is going to be when you cut yourself. This is a lot more detailed. We're going to actually talk about more about this when we get into um, the cardiovascular system. So I'm not going to dive into it right now, but you're promoting <clears throat> the increase in more and more smooth muscle contraction, things like that, so you can close up a wound to keep uh, body fluids from leaving. Um, hopefully this helps you out with positive and negative feedback systems and how they help maintain homeostatic mechanisms. Do you have any questions? Let me know.